In Japan, they're called Uminari. In the Netherlands and Belgium, they're mist poofers. Skyquakes, as they are most commonly known in America, are reports of unidentified loud booms. And to this day, there is no satisfactory theory to explain them. It's March 2021, shortly before 5 p.m. Residents from all over San Diego County report hearing a mysterious sound that literally rattles the entire community. Let's look at that again. The security cam footage shows a tranquil view outside the front door of a San Diego residence, rocked by what sounds like a loud snap, almost like a huge racket has just smacked a giant tennis ball. The reverberations are so strong that they set off a nearby car alarm. Investigative journalist MJ Benayas says skyquake events have been documented for centuries. We have a lot of worldwide accounts of people hearing these strange, loud explosion sounds that just come out of nowhere throughout history and around the world. There are accounts in the Bible of individuals hearing sort of the booming sounds of God. In the mythology of the Iroquois, if the creator spirit was upset, it would sort of emote via a large boom sound throughout the area. Of course, some mystery booms have quirkier explanations. In December 2020, residents of one New Jersey town were experiencing what they thought were skyquakes pretty frequently. The booms were so big that their houses were shaking. The thunder spirit in this case was construction worker Rob Bukowski, who says he made this cannon from scratch using scrap metal. Three, two, one. Holy shit. People were calling and saying bombs were getting dropped. Aliens were invading. Like, they didn't know what it was, so they put it on the news. So I called. I said, hey, man, I think this is me. Benias reminds us that the Bukowski cannon, like its inventor, is a rarity. That doesn't erase the countless boom phenomena that have occurred that seemingly have no explanation. Local police got calls about the San Diego skyquake from all across the county. Adding to the mystery, Seismic activity sensors didn't pick up anything at that time and location. So it's time to put our sound expert to work. This boom was around half a second in length with most of the acoustic energy below one kilohertz. Acoustic ecologist Dr. Ben Gottesman says that most of the booms people hear are the result of human activity. So first, he looks at the possibility that it could have been Tannerite, the explosive used in the growing trend of gender reveal parties. First, as we see here, the frequency spectrum doesn't match. Also, this San Diego skyquake was heard across the county. This Tannerite explosion doesn't have a radius beyond a few miles. And so we can rule out this sort of human-made explosive. Next, Gottesman wonders if this could be Mother Nature at play. Here we have a thunderclap. Similar to the San Diego skyquake, the majority of the energy is below one kilohertz. Unlike the San Diego skyquake, the sound lasts upwards of 10 seconds, whereas the San Diego skyquake was around half a second. So to me, that doesn't really line up. What about a sonic boom from a supersonic plane? Gottesman says it's possible. So here we have an explosion that lasts a little bit less than a second. And that's similar to what we see with the San Diego skyquake. But our aviation expert, Tim McMillan, thinks that's unlikely. What we heard in that video, there's nobody owning up to it. There are also regulations in place to where militaries can and can't travel excess the speed of sound to make sonic booms for the very reason, disturbing the peace. X out explosives, thunder, and sonic booms. Where does it leave us? The best conclusion we can come up to is they're a mystery. So, as we've seen, many skyquakes can be explained. But the San Diego skyquake is not one of them. It remains unsolved by local officials and the world of sound science. Our verdict? This is an unexplained phenomenon. October 2019, Gino Mikas is grouse hunting in northern Ontario with his wife and grandson. The family is on its way back to their car when they hear this. Mm. 
Let's hear it again. It's a series of blood-curdling cries echoing through the forest. It continues for about five minutes. I wish I knew what it was. I just don't know what to say it is because I didn't see it. People have been saying that it could be a Wendigo. In my culture, we really believe in that. Like, I, I didn't, but I'm kind of starting to think it could be something like that. The Wendigo Gino's talking about is a creature from the legends of the Algonquin tribes with a cry that stuns its prey and a penchant for human flesh. Typically, it's described as incredibly tall, emaciated looking, ashen skin, large, sunken, glowing eyes, pointy ears. Uh, it is often said to have very sharp teeth and to smell very bad and have very bad breath. The predominant characteristic is that it's cannibalistic with this never-ending hunger for human flesh. In fact, there is a psychiatric disorder referred to as Wendigo psychosis. This is characterized by strong compulsions which uh, lead to cannibalism. There were some famous sightings that were logged from the 1800s up through 1922 in and around Minnesota. And in each case, the sighting or encounter was followed by a mysterious and unexpected death. Thankfully for Gino and his family, their grouse hunting expedition only involved hearing this sound as opposed to seeing what might be responsible for it. But unfortunately for us, that means we can't get eyes on it either. So we asked our experts to take a listen. First up, wildlife biologist Dr. Stephanie Shuttler compares these strange sounds to the sounds of other known animals that roam these forests. Bears don't really communicate vocally at a long range, so they're not really projecting loudly out into the forest. So to me, it doesn't sound like a bear. Moose can make really loud noises as well, but they tend to make more of a bellow. This noise seems to be more harmonic. There's more of a variation in the vocality than you'd get from a moose. To me, it sounds more like a canid. Because it's a lower pitched sound, it kind of has like that bark howl mix. Next, soundscape ecologist Ben Gottesman compares the alleged Wendigo howls to the most credible alleged Sasquatch recordings on record, the Sierra sounds. Overall, the frequency is higher, and it doesn't have that slow, drawn-out feeling of the alleged Wendigo recordings. Under further scrutiny, Gottesman notices a puzzling detail about the original recording itself. It was when I normalized the sounds that I heard that there was some editing that was done on the recording. Do you hear that little click right there? This is a bad edit job. And because it wasn't a smooth transition, there's a jarring click. And that means that whoever was creating this was copying and pasting. Gottesman follows up playing on a hunch based on Shuttler's theory that this is some kind of dog. While the dog barks and the alleged Wendigo sounds weren't a complete match, I did hear some similarities. And so I stretched a dog bark and I lowered it. Let's compare that with these Wendigo sounds. It's pretty similar. So in conclusion, I think the Wendigo recordings are definitely altered and likely using a sample of a dog in order to create these mournful howls. So it turns out this is no Wendigo after all. Our verdict? What we're hearing is a hoax. It's probably the sound of a dog barking, stretched out and pitch shifted, to make it sound like something far more ominous. This story starts way back in the late 20th century, 1997 to be precise. Researchers from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, are using hydrophones to monitor volcanic activity. Now a hydrophone is an underwater microphone, 
initially developed to listen for Soviet submarines, since repurposed for research. And on that February 22nd, a strange sound is detected 1,500 miles west of the southern Chilean coast by two hydrophones nearly 2,900 miles apart. This is that sound. This underwater acoustic wonder instantly becomes known as the bloop. Let's play that again and turn it up. It may just sound like an air bubble popping in liquid, but that noise could be heard 3,000 miles away from its origin, making it the loudest underwater sound ever recorded at the time. But marine biologist Shea Conger explains that this version is sped up so humans like us can hear it better. The original sound seems to be a much lower, deeper tone. So the bloop was a pretty big deal because it was a unique, low frequency and highly powerful sound that was one of a kind, and he had nothing really to attribute it to. Some at NOAA believe the source may have been biological. The lead researcher at NOAA claimed that this was possibly a large, yet undiscovered animal that lives in the depths of the ocean. And for something like the bloop, it would take a very large creature, a very powerful creature, in order to make something like this. So could this noise have been produced by some sort of massive, undiscovered sea creature that's been lurking the depths of the ocean? If the bloop was made by an animal, then its lungs must be larger than any known living organism. But new species are discovered all the time. Just last year, a new kind of whale was discovered off the coast of Mexico. So could a monster massive enough to make the bloop really exist? Dr. Conger sees a dilemma here. If a huge animal lived near the surface, it would have been discovered by now. And if it lived thousands of feet down, it couldn't make a sound this loud. Animals that live at these depths tend to be actually pretty small and compact because the pressure they experience at that depth is a thousand times or greater than we experience at sea level. This is far outside the vocal range of something that would live in the deepest parts of our ocean. So it's really unlikely that this is some sort of undiscovered giant marine creature. So we took the bloop recording to our audio analyst, acoustic ecologist, Dr. Ben Gottesman. So if we don't believe it to be an animal, why don't we then compare it with one of the loudest human-made sounds we have in our oceans? And that is the sound of air guns. Seismic air guns are used by the oil and gas industry to search for new carbon deposits. They release compressed air, which forms a bubble that produces a loud sound that's reflected off the seafloor. Let's analyze this recording. Here we see pulses of an air gun which are very rhythmic. It has these regular intervals, broadband, loud sounds, and these can span similar distances to the bloop. But unlike the bloop, this is much more broadband. And the repetitive clicks that are so characteristic of air guns, we don't see with the bloop. But if the bloop is not man-made, where does that leave us? For answers, Gottesman turns to the planet itself. What you're hearing now are giant chunks of ice and glaciers breaking up. Similar to the bloop, this recording has been sped up many times over to make it audible. I was amazed when I heard this because we see the exact same spectral shape, the same duration. It's really a match to me. Gottesman says when an iceberg scrapes along the seafloor, it resonates like a tuning fork, producing a sound as loud as a magnitude 4 earthquake or the noise created by over 200 supertankers. So, Dr. Gottesman has settled it. Our verdict, this was the sound of glaciers breaking up. It turns out the bloop was not a monster, but something even more scary evidence of ongoing climate change in the Antarctic. In late 2016, several diplomats and other employees stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Havana, Cuba, report feeling ill after hearing a strange high-pitched noise. According to the Associated Press, this recording could be that noise. The sound is a high-pitched whine that seems to undulate, even writhe, which produces a nails-on-the-chalkboard effect. 
Similar attacks are later reported by U.S. officials in China, Austria, and Russia. Mark Polymeropoulos, a senior CIA official, believes he was targeted one night while on official business in Moscow. This was by far the most terrifying experience. Uh, the room was spinning. I couldn't stand up without falling down. I felt nauseous. I had an incredible case of tinnitus ringing in my ears, a headache. So I knew something was seriously wrong. The sudden onset of peculiar side effects baffles U.S. officials. Studies later show the injuries resemble a concussion, but with no signs of impact. Not only were we subject to an attack, but I think it's still ongoing. And that poses a lot of serious questions for the U.S. government. What was believed was going on at the time was diplomats were believing they were attacked by some sort of sonic weapon. Eventually, this is named Havana Syndrome. If the Havana Syndrome is caused by some sort of sonic weapon, it wouldn't be the first time that sound has been weaponized. This is something that goes far back in a more rudimentary form, using blaring loud music in different war zones. Now, as technology has advanced, there's been a lot of different hypothetical and actual practical operational platforms that use sound as a, as a weapon. The sonic weapon most commonly deployed today is the long-range acoustic device, which has been recently used by police departments to break up major protests and riots. The LRAD system was designed for crowd dispersal in a non-lethal way. These kind of weapons are only advancing, but sound is being weaponized more and more. So folks, this is scary stuff and very real. What is that sound recorded in Havana? Did it make U.S. personnel sick? Or was there some other weapon or force responsible? Let's ask our experts. Is the sound a recording of a sonic weapon? We asked our audio expert, Dr. Ben Gottesman. You can see most of the energy is concentrated between two and three kilohertz. This is a really sensitive spot when it comes to human hearing. It's why baby cries grab our attention so much. Whereas in the sound released by the Associated Press, we see that the frequency range is much higher, between six and eight kilohertz. And so the frequency ranges of these two sounds do not line up. But could this sound be some other sonic weapon? Gottesman has his doubts. And I've worked in some tropical locations, and there were times where I would hear very similar piercing calls. This sound is produced by a species of tropical cricket called the Indies short-tailed cricket. As you can see, the frequency range is a perfect overlap, and it also has similar harmonic characteristics. So I'm saying that it is a really clean match. So the sound is just chirping crickets, coincidentally recorded at the moment people were getting sick. So could Havana syndrome have been caused by a different kind of weapon, one people can't hear? In the medical studies that have been done, including the National Academy of Sciences report, a microwave weapon is the leading culprit right now. And that's based on the injuries that have been observed in different patients. Way back in 1962, an American scientist, Alan Fry, suggested a microwave weapon could be used to raise the temperature inside a person's ear by a millionth of a degree. That would be enough to cause a victim to feel dizzy nauseous or experience pressure in their heads. And get this, Fry later lectured on the topic to the Soviet Academy of Sciences in Moscow. So could the Russians be behind some new technology? While the injuries are consistent with exposure to microwave weapons, it's important to know that these type of weapons are unknown to exist. So frankly, it really is a mystery. There's enough physical and medical evidence that it does appear to be a weapon, but, but what is causing it is truly an unknown. It's a real concern. It's a split decision. Our verdict, the sound that was alleged to have caused the Havana syndrome is an Indies short-tailed cricket, coincidentally making that noise at the same time as the attack. But Havana syndrome itself is still an unexplained phenomenon. More than 130 U.S. officials have now been stricken. Recent incidents have even involved White House officials in our own nation's capital.